Good morning, Novesta. Uh, so glad that you have joined us on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, I want to welcome you to our live stream. Whether you have been a part of our church for forever or whether this is one of your first occasions to join us, we are so glad that you are a part of this. I want to invite you right now, uh, if you haven't yet, to take a chance to, to make sure you like Novesta Church of Christ on Facebook or subscribe to YouTube. Um, and also while you're doing that, if you want to share this video, that allows us to get into the hands of people in places that we haven't met or we don't know, but you do. And uh, many of you are watching today because someone has invited you, because someone has shared this. And so, um, you know, as our, as our Facebook group has grown, as our connections over Facebook has gotten better um, and, and wider, I want to invite you to take the chance. Think of a few friends that you know could be blessed by hearing God's word, by spending some time in worship, by being challenged to live a, a more faithful life. And uh, just think of them this morning. Send them a text, give them a call, say, hey, it's, it's not too late jump on for church and come be a part of this. We would love for them to join us. Um, again, if you're, if you're jumping on for one of the first times, just a little bit about our church. We are, we are an independent, Bible-believing, um, hopefully faithful, living, uh, love-extending kind of church. We're not going to be perfect, but we're going to take God's word. And we're going to share it with the world. We're going to take God's heart, and we're going to hopefully help others um, to experience the same. We live in grace, but we stand on the truth, and we invite you to come be a part of what we're doing. Uh, obviously, during this season of life, uh, we're doing things online and we're not meeting in person. But when we do, we meet just a little bit south of Cass City. And we are so very much looking forward to the day when we get to be back together with you. I want to take a second right now and just share with you um, uh, openly and honestly where we're at with that. Um, I know that here in the thumb, um, I, I think it'd be fair to say there's a restlessness. Um, it's probably a probably a kind word for many of us at this point. Um, and I know that's not for everyone, but I know there's a restlessness. There's a, there's a readiness to let's, let's get on, let's get going. Um, we as leadership, we've been meeting, we've been talking, we've been, been keeping um, alert to the things that are going on around us. Where we're at right now is this. Uh, we want to make sure that we are above reproach in not being arrogant in our assumptions or expectations of what's going on. Uh, last I checked, I don't have a degree in virology and neither do any of our leaders um, that are a part of our church. And so while we want to be wise and we want to be meeting together, we also don't want to, again, we don't want to come off with an arrogance that says we know more than everyone else around us. We don't want to come across with, a, with an attitude that says we don't care about our community or, or others that are a part of this. Um, I, I get it. Like, like if, you, if you're watching this morning, I, I know... I know from talking to many of you and from our leaders who have talked to many of you, we have a church that is a, a big, wide spectrum. And we know that there are some who are, who are very much still very fearful, very worried, very concerned, very much in favor of masks, in favor of staying in, in favor of all those things. And, and there's, there's good, good information that supports that. I also know there are many who are thinking that masks are ridiculous, that this is overblown, that there's other things afoot, that there's other plans going on, and there is some good information to support some of that situation too. I get that. We get that. We understand that. But I, I think as a church, and I think as Christians, the best place we can be in this is in a place of wisdom, is in a place of patience, and is a place of understanding that there's a wide spectrum of people and places that we're working with and that we're trying to love well. And so for now, for the, the foreseeable moments, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. And we may, we may look for some unique ways to keep loving people well as weather gets warmer, as new opportunities arise. Um, we're going we're gonna to try to be on top of that, but we don't want to be ahead of that. If you can follow me on that, okay? I, we we want to be on top of it. We want to make good, wise decisions. We want to we want to be together as soon as we can, but we don't want to be ahead of that. We don't want to try to try to claim that we know or be the ones that that get it wrong simply because we're arrogant or trying to rush ahead. I, I we I think Austin said it best in our meeting this week. We as a church have no other opportunity but to be above reproach when it comes to those decisions and to take everyone's safety seriously to love our community well, to care for our neighbors and friends. And so to do that, we're going to do this. And, and it's not what we would prefer 
but it is an opportunity that we have. And so, you know, joining in church with your family is important. Worshiping together as moms and dads, as husbands and wives, even if you're by yourself in your house, I want to celebrate that and say, hey, this is a moment where we can tune into God and connect with him on a very personal level in a very special moment each day that we gather together in church. And so I'm really glad that you're here this morning, and I'm so excited that you've tuned in. And I just, I pray that we don't, we don't grow restless in doing good, but instead we stay steadfast in our love for God and our care for others, and we, we, we stay hopeful and we stay helpful during this season that's, that's undoubtedly tough for a lot of us. Okay, that being said, I want to just a couple more announcements. I want to, I want to turn a little bit to some prayer, prayer requests. Um, Patty Peck has been a member of our church, um, was, was diagnosed again with cancer that has spread in her body, and, and her and Mark have made the decision that they're not going to pursue any chemotherapy, and so they brought in hospice to care for her and to, to be with her in this next season of her life and to be with them, um, and so she's at home being cared for. Mark is an awesome husband, and Mark, if you're watching, dude, bro, like, we love you. Patty, I want you to know we love you. We are praying for you, and we are here for you. Um, and just, just pray for them as they go through this season. Um, you know, I, I would love nothing more than to, to give you guys big old hugs. We're going to do a little air hug. And, uh, and truly, genuinely, there are many who want to extend that as well. And I also want to pass along uh, our prayers and our thoughts with the Frappert family. Um, Keith is a, is, a, is a friend that I got to know um, well-ish over the last few months. Um, and many of you know Keith Frappert here from our area. And he passed away. Um, a, a couple days ago, and uh, we're going to be doing a memorial service uh, to remember him. Um, he passed away from cancer, and we're going to celebrate his life on Thursday. And uh, I just want to—I want to say to the Frappert family how uh, how sorry we are for your loss. And uh, again, what a great man he was. But keep them in your prayers as uh, as they go through this time of grieving, especially in this season that is so hard to grieve in um, with just the limited access and, and availability to to connect with family. Turn our attention a little bit more. Um, just want to again say thank you to the incredible generosity that many of you have shown. Um, we we had a, an incredible month of April, um, but now it's May, and so again I want to I want to be so grateful for the generosity. But I want to just encourage you to keep on keeping on. That as God blesses, we simply return a portion of what He's given to us uh, in this season. What we do is we can give online through the Give app, which should be up here behind me every once in a while. You can give through Clover Give. Uh, which is a way to give through our church website, or you can send in a mail, a, a check through the mail as well. And again, I just I thank you for the incredible generosity that so many of you have displayed. Want to let you know there are a couple projects that we're moving forward with as a church that we decided on this week. Uh, we are going to be replacing the stucco in our middle middle wing. Um, that's uh, 17 years old, and it was supposed to last about 10. And so we are going to be getting that replaced. We approved that through a virtual board meeting, and that's a that's about a, a 7,000. I don't remember the number. I think 7,000 ish project um, it, for that, and uh, we also are going to be buying a new church copier, and so uh, our copier has been on its last legs for about nine years, um, and uh, our repairman finally said, hey, listen, like there, we are out of options, and so we approved that, and so, so we do have a couple big ticket items. We have money in the bank. We've been, been planning for this, um, but do want to let you know that even though church is different, church is still happening, and we're looking forward to when we're back together and using the building and needing those resources. So those are a couple things that are kind of, kind of big expenses that have come up that we're taking care of um, through generosity. And again, I, here's what I'd say when it comes to money, right? We want to be a church that operates out of opportunity, not out of obligation. We want to, we want to celebrate what God is doing, and we want to, we want to be blessing others um, instead of worrying about crunching numbers. And so that allows, your generosity allows us to live that way. Enough for announcements. I want to turn our attention to, to Jesus fully and completely today. And I really just want to invite you to pour into these next few moments. Uh, we're going to watch a kid's video again today. Uh, I thought that was fun. I love these videos. Um, and then we're going to go into a time of worship through, uh, through singing the song, How Great Is Our God, which has the, the, the new style of How Great Is Our God and the old style of How Great Thou Art Together and invite you to do that. The kid's video is, uh, is of Peter walking on the water. And, um, and, I, and I, I picked this video today because uh, this story, if you don't know it, um, it hopefully this, this lesson will be good for you. The story is a reminder that um, if we keep our eyes on Jesus, we can do amazing things. But when we notice the wind and we get caught off guard by the waves of life, we start to sink and we need to reach out to him. And maybe this, this virus, maybe this life, maybe this economy, maybe this situation has, has got you distracted. And you notice the winds are blowing and you felt the waves crashing 
and you've taken your eyes off of the king, I want to invite you through this simple kids video, I want to point you back to the God we can trust and to the Savior that we have and to the love that he extends, to the hope he offers, and to the peace that he can provide. So check out this kids video and then join us in worship. I'm really glad you're here today. Stories of the Bible. Peter walks on water. This is Peter. Hey Peter was a fisherman who was called by Jesus. Hey. Peter saw the many miracles of Jesus. Whoa! And he heard all his teachings. Great crowds followed Jesus wherever he went. One day after Jesus had done a great miracle, he sent the disciples in a boat across the lake while he stayed and sent the people home. See ya! Hey, Jesus! After sending them home, Jesus went up into the hills by himself to pray. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. Ah! In their fear, they cried out, It's a ghost! Hold on there. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I am here. Hmm. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. So Jesus said, Yes, come. So Peter went over the side of the boat. Whoa, you're awesome. And walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, ah! he was terrified and began to sink. Peter, help me! Save me, Lord! He shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. Jesus said, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him and said, you really are the Son of God.
hey, welcome back. We have a great, great God. And um, I just, I, I pray that as we, we sing the words of those songs, that it's not just some words that we've, we've sung or that we've listened to, but it's truly the, the heart set that we have, that God is great. Uh, we've been spending some time the last couple weeks in the book of Colossians. So if you have your Bibles with you, um, we'd love for you to open up to the book of Colossians. Um, and also just a reminder, if you didn't grab, we are going to be doing communion again at the end of the service today. And so I, I forgot to mention that when we first started. So make sure you have some elements on hand. Um, if that is some, some uh, grape juice, some orange juice, something that's, something that's wet and then something that's like bread. Bread, crackers, whatever that might be. We're going to be participating in that at the end of our service here today. And so um, if you haven't grabbed that yet, make sure you, you can pause the video now or you can go and grab some and have that on hand. But as I said, we've been diving into the book of Colossians. We've been going to the book of Colossians with this idea that there is something greater that God wants from us. There's a greater God that we need to trust in. There's a greater faith we can have that, that, that this, this life is not meant to be lived in the average, in the mundane, in the normal. It's not meant to be lived in just the, the ho-hum, in and out, back and forth, rat race kind of mentality. But God has called you and I to something greater. And today we're going to talk about how to have a greater life. That God truly desires, and I fully believe this, that the God of the universe desires for you and I to have a greater life than what we've often experienced. He's called us to have a greater life than what, what we think of as the American dream. He's called us to have a greater life than just, than just working a job and paying some bills and having a family and living in a house and, get, and then someday dying. God wants you and I to experience a greater life than what, what we even imagine sometimes. The Bible says, Paul says that, that now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. Jesus says that in John that he's come that we may have life and have it to the full. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to dive into Colossians chapter 3 and talk about what it looks like to have this great life, to have a life. Can you imagine having a life that is greater than what you can imagine? To having a life and having an opportunity to wake up in the morning and to not just be happy because it is warm outside, but to wake up and be happy because God has blessed you with a great life, with a greater life than you could have imagined, with a greater life than what you've had, a greater life than what you thought was available. Because when, when, when we turn to God, when we look at God's word, when we experience God's gifts, then we get to experience a greater life. And, and I want you and I to live that greater life. And that starts when we trust in him. So Colossians chapter 3 is where we find this, this greater life at. And I, uh, before we get there, I want to just back us up through Colossians 1 and 2. Because Colossians 3 starts with the phrase, since then. All right. So when, when, when a phrase starts, since then, you've got to go, well, where were we? Right? I want to remind us that, that a couple weeks ago we started this book of Colossians and we realized that we have been rescued by the God of the universe. Right? Remember that was, that was the verse that we preached, Colossians 1.13, for he, meaning God, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. And so, so you and I, we have experienced a great rescue. That our sins separated, but God's love saved. And we've been rescued, and then we've been reconciled, right? We've been brought together. We've been brought together with God, and because of that, there are great riches waiting for us. We talked last week about how those great riches and that great rescue leads us to have a great faith. Where we recognize and reject what is evil and untrue, and instead we focus on a faith that is real and genuine. Because of the great rescue that we have, because of the great reconciliation we've experienced, then that leads us to Colossians 3, where we find out what a great life looks like, right? That since then is realizing the rescue and the redemption, the reconciliation, the, the riches that are available for you and I. Since then, then we turn to where we are at now. Here's probably the biggest truth I could share with you today. Today's message is going to be about how we live a greater life. But we don't, we don't live a greater life or a better life to try to earn God's blessing. Okay, we don't, we, don't, we don't behave in a certain way in hopes that God will let us in. Instead, instead, we realize that God has already saved us, so we try to be better. We don't try to be better so that God will let us in. God has let us in, so we therefore try to be better. Listen to the words of Colossians 3. It's not as long as the other chapters. Here's what it says. It says, since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ. When Christ, who's your life, appears, then you'll also appear with him in glory. 
Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now, right? There, there's that, there's that, that, that flip, that switch, that change. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger and rage and malice, and slander and filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and to put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of its creator. Here there's no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and don't be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. And fathers, fathers, do not embitter your children or they'll become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it's the Lord you're serving. It's the Lord you're serving. We're going to end there. This morning, I want to just invite us to experience this greater life. And I want to do it by doing this. But a great aim for a great life. Most of us aren't dart players. Some of us are. But you know that in darts, if you're not aiming at something, you're rarely going to hit it right? If you're not aiming at your target, you're rarely going to get where you're going. Now, my family has a dart contest every year at Christmas time, and it's always interesting to see the different styles and the different ways that people go about it. My Aunt Ellen, and she's probably watching in the woods somewhere this morning, but Aunt Ellen, whenever it's her turn to play, like she just gets up, she kind of gets the darts, and she just chucks, 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 chucks. Now, on an occasion, I've been beaten by her because I'm really bad at darts, but overall, she doesn't perform all that well when it comes to her success rate because, well, to be honest, she rarely, really aims. She just kind of grabs the darts and flies. On the other hand, some of the, some of the guys are, are, more, are more skilled or more crafty. They take time to, to work on their form and to aim at a target so they can hit it. Listen, in our spiritual lives, right, Colossians 3 makes it really simple. Here's what, here's what Paul's saying. Listen, we know about the great rescue and the redemption since then. So what do we do? We set our hearts, right? We've been raised with Christ, so we set our hearts on things above, and we set our minds on things above, right? We, we, we have an aim. We have a target. Can I just ask you this morning, what are you aiming at? When it comes to your behavior, when it comes to your attitude, when it comes to your life, when it comes to your time, when it comes to your, your interactions with others, when it comes to what you're, what you're scrolling for and searching for on Facebook, what, what you're looking at on the internet, what you're investing with your energy, can I just ask you, what, what are you aiming at? Because occasionally, if you're, not, if you're not aiming at something good, you might get lucky and stumble upon it. But more often than not, you're going to be all over the board. And maybe you hit good, and maybe you hit bad, but if your aim isn't set on things above, if your aim isn't set on God, you're rarely going to hit what you're aiming for. So we need to set our aim if we want to have a great life. Here's what a great life looks like, though. Based on Colossians 3, I'm going to break it down into a couple of really simple, easy to understand at least to me, ways to understand it, right? Here's, here's the first way that we have a great life. Here's a part of the aim that we do. If you want to have a great life, and I'm guessing that you do, I know I want to have a great life, first thing we got to do is this. We've got to remove the junk, right? Colossians 3, Paul is talking to this group of people, this group of believers, and he says, listen, you want to have a great life? You got to get rid of the garbage, you got to get rid of the garbage, right? That's what he says there. He says, put to death whatever belongs to the earthly nature, sexual morality, impurity, debauchery. He says, listen, there's all this stuff. Don't lie to each other anymore. you gotta, you got to take that trash, and you got to put it where it belongs. 
You got to get it out of your house. You got to move it on. Listen to this verse here. Verse 8 says this, but now rid yourselves also of these things, anger and rage and malice, slander and filthy language from your lips. Right? Can, can I just kind of say that, that if we want to live a great life, it's got to start by taking the junk and putting it where it belongs. Now, thankfully, Christy and I are past the diaper stage with our kids, right? But there was a time when in the room of our house, we had a, a diaper daddy. And some of y'all, you know what I'm talking about. Most of you have experienced that. But there was this diaper daddy, right? And the diaper daddy was this magical little device that when Emily or Ethan were really little, when they did their thing, you would change their diaper and you would put the dirty diaper in the top of the diaper daddy. And then you'd take the handle and with one swoosh or flip, the diaper would disappear. Right? It was magic. It was just this diaper. I think there's another brand that's called Diaper Genie, and it's just, oh, there's no more stink. It's all gone. You don't have to worry about it. Now, if you're a parent, or if you can just think about this for a moment, there's really no such thing as a Diaper Genie. Once something's been done in those diapers, like sometimes it gets done in those diapers, is done in those diapers, there's no magic wand to get rid of it. Right? Like you can, you can flush it, you can flip it, you can store it in a bag, but at some point, that diaper genie is not going to hold up to what the diaper doo-doo has become. At some point, you got to flip that top, you got to grab that bag, and you got to remove it from your house. I don't remember the details now, it's been such a long time ago, but I remember that, that at one point when Christy and I had one of the little ones, or maybe both the little ones, I don't really remember, I know that we had went away from the house for a few days. So whether we went up north, whether we went on vacation, there had been a few days that we had escaped the, uh, the, the house and got away and were enjoying some time. And I still can picture walking back into the house after. Now, now this diaper genie was in a little room in the other side of the house, but I remember as we came in from the garage, as I opened that door, it very quickly became apparent that the diaper genie, the diaper daddy, had failed in his duties because the whole house reeked of the stink in one little basket, in one little room, in one little corner because of one little thing that was in a diaper. A little bit of mess stunk up the whole house. Spiritually speaking, guys, a little bit of mess eventually is going to stink up our whole house. If we're not choosing to be better, if we're not choosing to get rid, if we're not choosing to remove the junk and the garbage, the anger, the rage, the malice, the bitterness, the, uh, the lying, the idolatry, if we're not going to examine ourselves and if we're not going to try, to try to get rid of some of that junk, we're going to stink. At some point, if we don't get rid of it, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to rid us of any joyful smells. It's going to rid us of any joyful life. It's going to stink up our whole house. And can I just make a comment here about racism? I'm white. You all have probably noticed that. Most of you that are watching this are probably white. We live in a place where the demographics are, I think it's 98 or 90%, 98% white. Most of my interactions and most of yours are with white people. And we need to do better. We just do. We need to do better. We need to do better. You know, you know if you've got a problem because of the color of someone's skin. Listen, Paul calls out the Colossians. He says, listen, here there is no Greek or Jew. There's no circumcised or uncircumcised, no barbarian or Scythian, no slave or free. It's Christ. And you want to know what stinks really bad? Is a Christian who's a racist. I, I'm, not, I'm not thinking of anyone individually, but I know I'm thinking of some of us collectively. We need to do better. I don't care if you're short or tall. I don't care if you're a man or a woman. I don't care if you're black or white or anything in between. Whatever that looks like, whatever that difference, whatever that thing, Paul says there ain't no place for that in the church. So take the junk outside and leave it. Get rid of that stink before that stink is all that you smell. Secondly, not only do we got to remove the junk, right? It's about having a great life. A great life isn't just taking out the trash, right? The tra taking out the trash helps preserve that. But here's the second part. The second part is a great life also takes that, takes that emptiness now that we have, that, that clean house, and we replace it with love. Now, I, I'm not a car guy. I'm not, I'm not a truck guy, but I, I've been with people who are. And, uh, and I don't know if there's anything better than a big truck than a big truck that's jacked up. I don't know if there's anything better than a big truck that's jacked up that also is like a limo. 
Uh, and I don't know how well you can see this picture on the TV, but this is a big truck that is jacked up that looks like it has seating for 16 with still room in the back. Now, I don't know what they put in the back of that thing, but I'm just telling you, that'd be a pretty sweet ride. That'd be a pretty, pretty cool thing to be driving around town. That, that would catch the attention of the world. They'd be like, whoa, dude, I saw a limo. Well, I saw a truck. Well, I saw a monster truck. Well, I saw... It had eight doors. You know, it had four doors on each side. It had a big back. And... Here's what I want to challenge us with today, guys. Here's what I want to challenge us with as a church. Paul doesn't just, doesn't just slam on the Colossians and say, hey, change this and get rid of that and throw that all away. He says, he says but instead... He said, therefore, he said, but instead, he said, clothe yourselves, right? Put something else on. Instead of just removing the junk, he says, it's not enough just to remove the junk. You've got to replace it with love. He says, clothe yourself with compassion and kindness, humility and gentleness and patience. He said, bear with each other and forgive each other. Put on love, which holds it all together. Listen, church, we need to be walking around like souped up, jacked up, fully modified, fully uh, just loaded Christians who are full of love and compassion and kindness, who are giving it out in spades and are offering generosity and extending hope and offering help and just being the kind of people, being the kind of lives that people around are like, whoa, like that is a, that is a tricked out Christian right there. They are so full of love. They constantly forgive. They're always being kind. They're always extending compassion. Man, that, that, is, that is worth talking about. That is worth noticing, just like this truck. Listen to what Paul says here, right? In, in verse 14, over all these virtues, you put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Listen, church, God is calling us. Paul is encouraging them. God is calling us to live lives of love, that we remove the junk, yes, but we also replace that with love so the world around us can be blessed by our behavior and by who we are. By our bodies going by them, we bless them. Th a third thing that we're going to do is this. A great life's going to let Jesus rule. i got to be honest. I, I struggle to let things happen. Um, I struggle to let my kids win. I struggle to let others make decisions. I struggle with that word let. Let is, a, it, it's an action, right? It, but it's a frustrating action because letting something happen is difficult. And yet, listen to what the verse says here. Verse 15 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. It goes on to say, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Letting is a choice. It's an option. It's a decision where I let Jesus rule in my life. If I were to be honest, and I think probably if you were too, it's a whole lot easier to hold our anxiety. It's a whole lot easier to hold our fear. It's a whole lot easier to hold our decisions. It's a whole lot easier to hold my choice and my life and my, everything about me by myself to decide, to choose. But Paul tells them then, and he tells us now, let. Let the peace of Jesus run your life. Let the word of God nourish your life. Church, if we're going to enjoy this greater life God's called us to, we've got to let Jesus rule. We don't have to figure out the route. We don't have to know the course. We don't have to have the destination decided. We simply have to follow where Jesus leads. That's all we have to do. We just have to follow where Jesus leads. We let Jesus rule. We let Jesus run. We let Jesus lead, and we simply follow. Listen, you want a great life. We definitely got to remove the junk. We definitely got to replace that with love. But we also got to let Jesus rule in our lives. We got to let him set the, set the course. We got to let him set the sails. And we simply are along for the ride. We, we, we hop on the dusty road and we go where our Savior leads. One more, one more truth I want to share with you, and it's simply this. A great life simply realizes their opportunity. When you get to the end of Colossians 3, you see that Paul gives some instruction, some encouragement to different people, right? And he tells wives to submit to their husbands, and you're like, oh, you know, let's fight down that. No, listen, listen. In other passages of Scripture, he says submission is out of reverence for Christ. And so, so we all should submit to one another. We all should place our needs uh, below others' needs. We all should put others first in our lives. Philippians 2 says our attitude should be the same as Jesus, who was definitely above us, but went well below us and served as a slave. And so there's this opportunity for wives to submit to their husbands as is fitting in the Lord. But then it goes on right after that. It says, husbands, love your wives, right? And, and don't be harsh with them. 
And it goes on to talk about the kids. Kids, listen to your parents. Obey your parents. Fathers, fathers, don't be a jerk to your kids. Don't be harsh with them. Don't embitter them. Don't push them. And then it goes on to slaves and masters even. It says, it says listen, slaves, obey your masters. It says, masters, don't be harsh with your slaves. So whatever role you're in, whatever, whatever place you're at, listen, realize that to have a great life, there's an opportunity that you need to realize. That there is a moment and a thing and a way that you can live that extends the love of Christ to others. And whether you are a kid or an adult, whether you are a mom or a dad, a husband or a wife, a, a teacher or a student, a boss or an employee, and whether you are young, whether you are old, whether you are healthy, whether you are sick, the Bible says this, we've got opportunities to love well the world around us. Listen, I believe that Jesus is calling us to a great life. And we know that we've been rescued. We know that he's offered us reconciliation. And we know that we have access to his incredible riches. So then, we live a better life by removing the junk, by replacing that with love, by upgrading to a life that is generous and kind. We, we let Jesus rule. We let him set our course. And we realize the opportunities that we have. I, today, I just want to invite you to consider for a moment what your great life could look like. What would happen if instead of fighting your battles, you let God fight them? What if instead of, instead of living in the sins that you're stuck in, you threw them aside and took that trash out the door? What smell or fragrance would come from your life if you got rid of the junk and the garbage that's mentioned here in Colossians 3? What would happen if you not only got rid of that junk, but you upgraded, you replaced that with compassion? Instead of holding bitterness and anger, you released it with compassion and kindness. Instead of holding grudges, you offered forgiveness. Instead of picking sides or labeling people, you instead chose Christ and to love everyone. What would happen if we truly let Jesus rule? And what would happen if we realized the opportunities we had and worked to make the most of them every day? I'll tell you what would happen. We would realize the great life that awaits us in the Lord. We would realize what a world we can change, what a difference we can make, what, what grace we can extend, what hope we can offer, what love we can make available. Church, I look forward to what we're going to do when we remove that junk and we replace it with love. I look forward to the church we're going to become, to the love we're going to extend, to the community we're going to shape, and to the grace we're going to offer. And that happens because of the rescue we've received, the reconciliation we've experienced, and the riches that are made ours in Christ. Will you pray with me? Father, this morning, I thank you for this book of Colossians. I thank you for it being straightforward and simple. I thank you that there's not a complicated formula. This isn't complex theology. God, you have a great life. You have a greater life than we can imagine waiting for us. God, and that happens when we, when we, recognize, when we recognize the rescue that you made for us. You pulled us out of the garbage that you rescued us from the darkness and brought us into light, that you reconciled us fully and completely through the, through the gift of Jesus, but that you have incredible great riches waiting for us, available to us through your Spirit and through your Son. And God, I just pray you'd be with us, that we would pursue this great life, not to, not to get heaven, but because of heaven. Not to get your favor, but because of your favor. Not to earn our way in, but as a response to you making a way in. God, I pray that you would just be with us as we seek to live out this better life. It's hard sometimes to remove the junk. Some of those habits die hard. Some of those, some of those tendencies are tough. Some of those dispositions are pretty ingrained. But I know that you're the God that can break chains. I know that you're the God that can bring hope. I know you're the God that can, can wrestle free people from addictions. And so I pray that you do that. I pray you'd help us to replace that with love to let you rule, and to realize the opportunities before us. God, would you bring about this great life that you've promised and help us to live it fully today. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, as I said, we're going to participate in a time of communion. And um, just as we wrap up our service today, I want, to, I want to point us to a passage in the Old Testament. I want us to go to, to uh, the book of Exodus. And uh, Exodus and communion don't often go together. Um, not that they can't, but it's just not a, a typical passage of Scripture that you go to. But there's a passage in, in, in Exodus that I wanted to share with you. Because in, in Exodus 14, the Israelites have, have left Egypt. The, the plagues had been carried out. But, but at this point, Pharaoh's realized that his, his labor force is gone. 
He's realized that people have escaped and that they're gone, and he's not going to have his slave labor. He's not going to be able to build his, his towers and his, his pyramids. He's not going to be able to, to, to survive the way that he's set up. He's grieved. He's angry. He's mad. And so he sets out in pursuit of the Israelites. And the Israelites get out in this desert, and they look up, and they're in this precarious position. Uh, on one side is this huge sea, and on the other side is this angry army, and they are literally stuck between a rock and a hard place, maybe between a sea and an angry soldier's. And they look up and they are stuck and they're not sure what to do. They feel like they're trapped. They feel like they, they were almost where they wanted to be, but now they're, they're cornered, they're pinched. They don't know what to do. They certainly can't cross the water and they certainly can't fight the soldiers. And so they're not sure what they're going to do. They're not sure that they're, how they're going to get out. And Moses simply responds to them with these words. It says, Moses answered the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. You need only to be still. If I can just be honest, and if you just be honest with me, being still has gotten to be really, really hard over these last few weeks. It's hard to be still when someone politically opposed to you makes a dumb comment, and you want to respond. It's hard to be still when your livelihood has been cut off, when your job's been taken away, when your lifestyle's been uprooted, when your whole world has been changed. It's hard to be still. It's hard to be still when government there demands how you live here. And you miss out on reunions and birthdays and opportunities. When seasons get canceled, when dreams get smashed, when people are blocked, it's really hard to stay still. I feel it. I'm living it. And it's hard. I feel like there's, there's a sea on one side and there's soldiers on the other. There's nowhere to turn. There's nothing to do. And the anxiety just builds in me and in you. So what do we do in this moment? I think we look up. I think we, we trust him. I think we realize that he's going to fight for us. He sees your hurt. He feels your pain. He understands your grief. And he says, I got this because I got you. And so we be still. And we trust him to do the fighting. It doesn't mean we don't respond. It doesn't mean we don't, we don't make decisions. What it means is that we quiet our spirits and we look to him for hope and we trust he'll send help. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. At this time of communion, we, we remember he fought for us. We remember that he helped us. He brought us hope in the name of a Savior in the place of the cross in the redemption of our sins. And so we're going to play a song, and we're going to take communion. I'm going to invite you to take the body, the bread, the crackers, and remember that the Lord will help you, and that the Lord will be with you. And we're going to take the bread, or we're going to take the juice, we're going to take the, the wine, we're going to take the, the whatever it is that you're using, and we're going to remember that his blood was shed, and there's hope for you because of what he did, because of what he gave, because of what he extended. And then, because of that help that he offers and because of that hope that he brought, we're going to build our life on that truth. And we're going to worship along to this song during communion time. It's called Build My Life. We've sang it many times here in church. And my prayer is that we would build our life upon the hope and the help of Jesus. That we'd be still for a moment and recognize that he's in control. And regardless of what is chasing us, and regardless of what is in front of us, our God will fight for us. His help is available, 
and his hope is eternal. I want to invite you to participate in communion and to sing along to this song as well. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you
Hey, really glad that, uh, that you were able to join us for church today. And again, um, we look forward to the day of being back together in person with you. I'm um, really excited about that, that possibility and what that's going to look like after being away. I think there's going to be some sweet fellowship and worship and uh, great connections to come. Uh, in the meantime, let's continue to stay hopeful. Let's continue to stay helpful. Let's look for ways to meet the needs of our community. Let's love well our families and uh, truly make the most of these moments that we have uh, with them. You know, the different times, the different season, it will be over. It will pass. So make the most of these moments. I want to invite you, um, if you haven't yet given us your email or sent us a connection, you can still do that. Um, you can send that to me right now at bdspears at yahoo.com or at novestachurch at yahoo.com. If you're watching through Facebook or YouTube, if you comment or message, I think those will all come to us too so we can see that. But send us a message with your email. We'll add you to our, our email prayer chain, our email link that sends out our information, updates on what's going on. All of those things. We are going to be hopping on Zoom here in a minute to do a little time of prayer and sharing with whoever would like to do that. That code went out on email today. Um, so you have that. If not, I can send that to you in a few minutes as well. Um, and just one more prayer request that I forgot to mention earlier, and I apologize. Uh, Sherry LaPeak's dad um, has been struggling with some things, and he had what they believe was a stroke, um, I think, on Friday. Um, tests have come back good, but he's had to be in the hospital. I know that him and Sherry are going to have to be quarantined now because they were, were rushed and transferred and you know exposed to uh, possible opportunities. So keep, uh, keep Sherry LaPeak in your prayers and also her dad. I know that they, they got good news last night, but would appreciate our prayers for sure. So um, have a super awesome and blessed day. Uh, now, I got to explain because there's been some questions. I usually end with a, with a deuces. Um, love y'all. Peace out deuces, right? And so you look that up. Um, my intention with the deuces has always been this. Paul always ended his letters with grace and peace be yours in abundance or grace and mercy and peace be yours. And so when I'm saying that, what I'm doing is I'm offering you a peace just like Paul would offer a peace. Um, and Garrett called me out. He said, well, yeah, but deuces means two twos, which means peace is. Um, and I said, no, it means I'm offering you peace and you're offering me peace back. So when we do that, when we say deuces together, it's like, hey, I'm saying peace to you and you're saying peace to me. And that's the way that we go peace together. So I will say it one more time. Really glad that you're here. Have a super awesome, amazing week. Love y'all. Peace out. Deuces.